Lord God, bless us tonight as we study your word, especially as we consider the end of time and when you'll bring us home to be with you in heaven forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Can I get a sound checks from everybody here? Lyra, your microphone's working. How you doing? Yeah. Okay. See? Good. Perfect. How about you, Charlie? Is it working out there? Oh, we lost the Abiding Grace one, but that's okay. Can we hear you? Man, I should have grabbed the napkin. These are going to be messy. Hello. Perfect. All right, we can hear you. All right, sweet. So, well, we'll save that for a minute. So today, class. We've got a small group here, which will make it maybe extra fun. We've got a couple of Oh, you just got to unless the thing. Oh, here. Before I forget next, don't look at it right now, but here's your test back. Okay, I'll do it over here for it. And you did a nice job. All right. Excellent. Yeah, that's really awesome. We'll talk more about it after, okay? No, it's okay. It's okay. I have to go and get it literally right now, but that's nice of her. All right. So you guys had 57 for tonight. Did everybody get a chance to get them? 57, your last time hanging out with Paul. We've been hanging out with him for weeks on his journeys across the in a, kind of the known world. We see him going to Rome for his uh his trial before Caesar. Any notes, any questions on lesson 57? Anything you wondered about, had trouble answering? So this one's not called a missionary journey because remember he's under arrest. It was a pretty loose arrest because they didn't see the Romans didn't see him. Yeah, it's like a house arrest kind of. You know, they didn't see him as as great threat. But they went through some pretty crazy stuff. They were on the island, and then Paul got bit by that snake, and everybody was like, ah. Oh. And then he was fine. Yeah, showed him that he was from God. All right, so yeah, there was some exciting stuff there. There were even Christians all the way over by Rome. Did you notice that? That's a that's a miracle of God. To think that Christianity is spreading that far already. That's... Yeah, people had, people had come to hear him. Like, Paul hadn't even been there but they knew god so that means it's spreading it's not just paul who's teaching about god but his message is going to one place and that's going out from there just like it does today all right so let's look at the key questions whoops i'm skipping a bunch of this stuff for now let's just uh go right, right to the key questions how was god to his promises to Paul, even that they would live. Yeah, he survived and made it to Rome just as Jesus promised. Boom. Number B. Oh, something in your own words. You got this. Once in Rome, just like being under house arrest, what would Paul have to do? Yeah. Yeah, we got word. And we also have reason to think he wrote some of his New Testament books in Rome, too. So pretty cool stuff that he was able to still do. So he was able to share God's word. All right. Even if it meant his death, he would not stop preaching and teaching the gospel. Why do you think that was? See you Trusted in God. That's a good one. How many reasons to add to that? Grow the church. Yeah, it's really important, right? So a message is too important. People must hear about Jesus as the only thing. And I think you can definitely add what you said to Seal. He trusted in him. He knew that, you know, he said the lid is Christ. You know, he's going to take care of him. So, yeah, this was way too important of a message to stop, even when death is there. That's really hard. 
that's a difficult thing that God gives us the strength to say it too. Um, I pray that God keep giving you guys that strength too. And I pray that you never have to face death for Christ, but if you have to face pain or something else, we can still stay true because he gives us strong faith because it trusts in him. But let's think about what maybe specifically gave Paul comfort here. What are some things that you can remember that Jesus has said that give us comfort even in death? Or maybe some other things that the, or just the Bible in general. Anyone think of? Oh, here's the lights. He's tuning in. <laughs> Look at this. Nice. Sila? Yeah, you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. He was, uh, a few weeks ago, we had that lesson where Jesus was talking, remember before Lazarus died, or when he died, Martha came running out to Jesus and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus said some really beautiful stuff. And one of them was one of your memory passages for this year. He said, I am the... Oh, he who believes in me will die. Will live. Anyone lives? You're almost there. Can anyone finish it off for him? So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, he who believes in me will live. What's that, Sila? Even though they die, right? So maybe Paul had that in mind. He remembered that even if he dies, he's going to live because of what Jesus has done. All right. So now we're going to jump backwards. That's lesson 57. We're going to jump backwards to do some review. Oh, my goodness. Just to make sure we're ready for the test next week. And to go in the book. All right. So there are all sorts of tools people use, right? Like a builder has his hammer and nails and his drill, all that stuff. A football player uses his pads, his, I don't know, all sorts of other stuff. His feet is a body. Yeah, that's a tool. Um, doctors, what are the things doctors use? Heartbeat thing, a stethoscope. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? A lot of tools. It's okay. It's okay. The, the other things that are shaped in different ways, right? All the different shapes and sizes and scalpels and yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, looking here. I actually don't think I know what that's called either. So yeah, um, he has tools. Is it really hard for a doctor to do their work without tools? What do you think? It'd be pretty hard. Do you, imagine doing a surgery, but you don't have any tools. That would be impossible. Is it pretty hard? Hard to build buildings without tools. tools. Yeah. Okay. I know it's silly, but I'm making a point. The Holy Spirit uses tools too. What tools does the Holy Spirit use? And this is for Zoom, so don't shout it out here. Zoom, tell me what tools the Holy Spirit uses when he's doing his work. Hmm. Is that Lillian? Is that a hand from Lillian? He uses us to spread his word. Okay, very good. So he does use us to spread his word. But I think in the second half, you've got the specific tool he uses first. We carry some of the tools the Holy Spirit uses. What do we carry or what do we bring to people? Word. Mm, there you go. The word. So that's one of the tools. Someone else on Zoom, what's the other tool? Or tools? So you've got God's word. And? A church. Knowledge. You said knowledge, Gabe, and then the church. The, something that happens in the church. Gabe just said it, the sacraments, right? So remember, we're talking about the means of grace. We've been reviewing this multiple weeks now. So make sure you guys know this. The means of grace are those tools 
that oh so where was i oh yeah tools of the trade so the means of grace you can always think of them as the tools of the trade i can't draw on this tonight but remember how well, i guess i got a board though the how so don't be afraid to use it or a question like it. You're more than welcome to oh, let's see it. Remember how Pastor likes to no. <laughs> how Pastor likes to draw it? He's got this, he's got like the barrel of God's good stuff over here. And the means of grace is how he gets that to us. So the word, the word and sacrament. Right? And that's how he gets it to us. Or does he do a heart? I'm trying to remember that he feels it. I can't remember. But what's so? What was the God's good stuff? Anyone remember part of it? Forgiveness is one of them. So we've got forgiveness. Super terrible handwriting. Gabe. Salvation. And then. <gasps> I want to see if anyone on Zoom has it. What was the third one? So forgiveness. Salvation. There's usually one put between that. What's that, Gabe? What'd you say? Forgiveness, salvation. What would it be? All right. You need some help from here. See, I'm going to go with Sila. Not eternal life. So that's kind of wrapped up in salvation, but very close. No more sin. No, we still sin, right? We don't have to be pay the punishment for our sin. Forgiveness yeah. from sin. It says believing. That's a good one. All right, fine. We're going to go with Max. He's, he's really stretching. New life. New life. So forgiveness, new life, and salvation. And the fact that you weren't remembering that one makes me think we got to remember what that is. So if this is salvation, this is forgiveness, makes us right with God. Salvation is that eternal life, like Sila said. New life is talking about how it's not just something we wait for when God calls us as his own through the Holy Spirit, through the means of grace. But it's something that changes us right now. It changes our hearts. We want to do good before God. We want to follow his decrees and show him love and show love to our neighbors because he's it's working in our hearts because that reminds me of another thing that we can draw called sanctification remember sanctification you often see it drawn now you guys get to see how bad i am at drawing hearts okay that wasn't too bad i'm getting nervous okay can you guys see that over my podium sorry so anyways we should finish this up first so forgiveness new life salvation gives it to us what are the words and word and sacraments called? Everybody's going to need to know this. What are the word and sacraments called? How God gets his good stuff to us? It's got the word grace in it. Means of grace. Everybody make sure you know that word. Means of grace. The word and sacraments. It's how God, the Holy Spirit, gets his work or gets his good stuff, forgiveness, new life, and salvation to us. So when we're talking about that new life, we're talking a lot about sanctification. And so everybody can see it. And remember, you can draw this kind of a thing on here so that we get the forgiveness, new life, salvation. Is this, I don't understand. I, don't, I, I give up. We're going we're gonna to put it on this, on this board over here. <laughs> All right. So new life, we're talking about a lot about sanctification sanctification is another word that you guys need to know so remember how our hearts look to G look to god before he comes into our hearts before he gives us faith what does the bible say about us without god what are some things i see gabe's hand first so go ahead what's that hostile to god yeah hostile to god see that dead in our sins and transgressions mm -hmm. Anyone else remember some?
Some other ones that the Bible says is that everyone's thoughts are evil all, all the time. King David says we're born in sin, even conceived, and we're sinful. Um, Ephesians says we're nature deserving of wrath. So when God looks at our hearts, here's how you can draw it on the test. So watch this, and this helps you remember. When God looks at our hearts, he sees blackness with sin, right? He sees sin all over our hearts, okay? And we're talking about sanctification here. I should have checked if I can make sure as well as sanctification. Nice long word. Let's see if someone else has the first game. I appreciate that you know a lot of these. Anyone remember what sanctify means? Remember this song? Worship that. I'm seeing it. It's now think about it. It's a decent agree, disagree. Because are we holy in God's sight right now? Right? And so God starts transforming our hearts. And so now there's some light in our heart. Now we draw our heart. That's like half like this. And in our lives of sanctification, remember God gives us new life through the means of grace. He's slowly he, Key word to know as you guys finish up your year. And we got. A... All right. So we talked about the means of grace. We talked about sacraments. Let's see what time is it? 707. We got to keep moving, but who can tell me what three things are required for a sacrament? Well, let's see if we can do three different people answering. Can anybody on Zoom give me one of the things that a sacrament needs to be? God's word. What's that? God's word? Close. Earthly. What's that, Lillian? Earthly. An earthly element. That's one of them. Thank you. Earthly elements, one of the sacraments, or one of the things. For a sacrament, I'm going to go with uh, Emma. I haven't heard from you in a little bit. Instituted by Christ. So, Gabe, you were close with God's word. But we're talking specifically Christ's word when he said we should do this. Okay, so instituted by Christ. And what's the third one? So, has earthly elements instituted by Christ? Max got it. Gives forgiveness of sins. So, sacrament. I another great definition that you guys can know if you don't already get it down. Sacrament is instituted by Christ, has an earthly element connected with God's word, and it gives the forgiveness of sins. And you should know that because it's a means of grace, right? And what do the means of grace do for us? Back to this forgiveness, new life, salvation. So there's that can help you remember it. Oh, a sacrament's a means of grace. That means I get those things. All right, great.
So that's a sacrament. So the two sacraments are, of course, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we see how they're sacraments in each one, right? Let's start with Christian. Christian, what earthly element is in baptism? Remember, sacrament, earthly element. What earth? Uh, we're having some major internet issues, unfortunately. Could you hear me, Christian? Earthly element in baptism? And if I ever can't Water. hear you, just type. Okay. So we got well This is, I don't think we have time. This is your patch for today. That's Hi, guys. Sorry about all the problems. I don't know why the internet's. We were just talking about what we think of when we think of heaven. If anyone else willing to share? Perfection. It's kind of hard to picture perfection, isn't it, Gabe? Clouds. clouds. Yeah, lots of clouds. Well, what if I told you heaven isn't just going to be up in the sky or off in some other place? But we're going to see today that heaven. And eternal life is more than just heaven. One day it'll be a new heavens and a new earth, the Bible tells us. We don't know a lot of details about that, whether it's going to be this one made perfect or if God's going to completely redo everything. But we're going to, it's, it's going to be, but it's going to be better. Um, Better. And we can't even imagine what a perfect earth is still on the ground. Soil is because dead things die and they break down. And then you've learned about that in science in school. I'm sure you have, right? How about that's how soil works. So, so much of this world is built on imperfection. 
sin, because sin equals. And so this world is going to be beyond our understanding. It's so amazing. And it's important to remember that because it's not just about floating around in clouds all day or whatever, or something like that, but it's going to be amazing. It's it's going to be beautiful. We're going to see some of the picture, pictures today. So keep in mind, hey guys, keep in mind that when we're talking about, when we're reading Revelation, well, actually, this little paragraph will give us a great, a great highlight of everything we're, that we're talking about when, we, when we're talking about Revelation. So, so I'm have, uh, let's see who's going to read this bit. You should be wondering. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. On top of the italics on the top of the page. The end of the era, the sky may be muffled on the sense of vision, according to our sense of information. This is an introducing to you that is in common of word in scripture. Right now, right now, picture. Picturesque. That's the big word I was talking about. Yep. Yeah, God's promises made are God's promises kept. One thing I want to highlight in there. Notice it says this vision. Sure. Some people let their minds go crazy about Revelation. You've probably heard of things like the rapture. And there's movies that are made about that. It's people taking the picturesque language. So picturesque means like beautiful and symbolic and all these things. And they go crazy about it. And they overread all these different things, like all the years that are in the Revelation. But Revelation is meant to be this beautiful vision. It doesn't say anything different than the Bible's already said. But just give us an idea of the splendor of, of heaven and eternal life with God and how God's won the victory. Um, so it's important to remember that Revelation is picturesque language. And you're going to see that today. I'm really, really excited for you guys to get a look. Um, yeah. So everybody open up to the last book of the Bible. I know that ones who are here already did. We're going to Revelation today. You got a true Bible. Do you need one? You want All right. So yeah, turn to the last book of the Bible. Revelation 12. Wow. And we're going to read this one together. We really don't have that many verses to read tonight. So I'd like us to do a person takes a verse. Um, Zoom, because of the internet, I'm not going to have you take part in this one. But please follow along. Okay, we're going to be in Revelation 12. Okay. Right. So Jesus defeated Satan completely, freed his people from the terror of Satan's power and sin and death. And that's what we're going to get to see. So remember, before we start reading, what is what kind of language does Revelation have? I want you to remember that word. Picturesque, picturesque, symbolic. Because right away, you're going to be like, oh, this is kind of weird. But you have to remember, heaven is impossible for us to wrap our minds around. And the victory and Jesus and God fighting in heaven against the devil and throwing down his ape, all this stuff. So it's described in ways to help us understand it. Lots of metaphors and pictures. Okay. So verse, let's start with the first six verses. So everybody make sure you're following along. Make sure you're at the start. Chapter 12. I'm looking at you, Max. Well, Selah's verse one, Emma's verse two, Lillian's verse three, Ethan's verse four, Gabe's verse five, and Max's verse six. Revelation chapter 12. Go ahead. Seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on the 
Yeah, so there you see one of those numbers, right? Doesn't mean a literal number, but it represents it's, it's a multiple of 12, which is a very complete number. All right, so maybe a little weird. We're going to break it down. And one of the ways we do that, oh, great. I want the green thing to come up already. But we should, we, one of the things we live by as the church, as the church is we, we should let scripture interpret scripture. What do you think that means? Ethan, can I pick on you? Letting scripture interpret scripture? Can you explain that in your own words or give it a try for me? Maybe a better word than interpret to help you? Let scripture explain scripture. What are we saying we should do? Very good. He said, don't try, try to explain scripture on your own, but let it explain itself. That was a really great answer. I'm going to put a gold star on that one, Ethan. Excellent. Yeah, we want to look, when we're confused in one part of scripture, we want to look somewhere else and look for clarity because God's word is how he speaks to us in the Bible. Means of grace. I'm just going to keep hammering that home. So you remember means of grace, word and sacraments. He's, he gives us things through that. So we want to use his word to understand it. So here's what we have for that. When we have questions about God's word, we look elsewhere. And you gotta remember, who wrote this thing? Yeah, human beings did, but God works through them, right? So when we have questions, we let God's word. So we're gonna do that for these first few verses. That's what this book has us do. So in the verses you just read, we see that the woman represents God's Old Testament church. What special child had God promised going all the way back to Abraham and even Adam and Eve? What special child, Max? Yeah, the Savior, Jesus. So this was like going to be the gift given to the church. That's why the church is seen as like giving birth to that woman, because that Savior is coming. All right. So we know this from the rest of scripture and here too, that sometime after creation, Satan led a rebellion against God and it was in heaven. And many of God's angels joined him in rebelling against God. Uh, um, and we see that described here with picture language. So here in Revelation 12, Satan is pictured as a great red dragon. I think Lillian read that verse. Yes, there are dragons in the Bible. We see them here in this vision. Um, and he's got seven heads and seven crowns. So he's trying to be like God, you know, with all these things. In verse four, the dragon swept one third of the stars out of the sky. What does this picture? So remember, we're using scripture to interpret scripture. So look at the first half of that. We know that this happened. So what do you think this dragon called Satan and wiping out the stars in the sky? What does that represent? Ethan? You're right on. Yep. Taking the, taking the angels with him. Satan dragging a significant number of angels down with him. Yeah, and you're starting to see. Imagine... It's so easy to read Revelation and be like, okay, this just means that. But put yourself in the Apostle John's shoes. He's on an island and he's exiled for preaching about Jesus. So many of the other disciples died for preaching about Jesus, but he got exiled. Do you know what exile on an island means? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Have you seen Cast Away? You ever heard of that movie? He's alone on an island. Maybe some of you have seen it. I'm probably dating myself. But it's a fun movie, yeah. So I don't, maybe I, I I don't remember if it's inappropriate or not. So don't take my word for that. But anyways, so you've got him stranded there, right, all alone, and then all of a sudden, he's this. And it would have been terrifying. There's this be afraid of that. And it would have fear in him, but then we see, we're going to see as we keep reading how this dragon is defeated. And that would have brought him such calm because he was so afraid of this dragon. So this is big stuff that God is showing him. So what did the dragon try to do to one of the women, to the woman's child? I want to do this. What did the dragon want to do to the woman's child? Did you catch it? Anybody? They wanted to beat the child. Not just beat it, but it rhymes with beat. They wanted to kill the child. It rhymes with beat. <laughs> they wanted to eat the child. They wanted to devour the child. So it was standing ready for this woman to give birth so we could instantly snatch up and eat this child. Okay? So that's what we see happens in Revelation. Devour him when he was born. But now, remember, we're letting scripture interpret scripture. We got to talk about what that means and what that could represent. So if the dragon represents Satan and the child represents the coming savior, what is this scene showing us? You got a thought, Max? Yeah, something like that, Gabe. Yeah, trying to kill Jesus. Did Sila? Yeah, wow, Sila, look at that. That's really good thinking. That's great using scripture to interpret scripture. That's awesome. Because now look at number four. You're right on. So I need a few people to look up these. I'm going to let Sila do, do math. Do two, 13 and 16 because of what she just can you do four, eight to 10. And then let's have Max. Why don't you look up Luke, Luke 22, three to six for us. Put something in Revelation so you don't lose your spot. Maybe your pen. So we're looking at ways of how Satan tried to devour or destroy Jesus throughout his life. Luke 20, look at the page, Luke 22, three to six. And while you're looking that up, Sila's going to read for us. Let's all listen to Sila. Um, hopefully you guys on Zoom can hear her a decent amount. I'm going to turn it toward her a little bit. Um, Sila, go ahead. Read us uh, those two verses. Yeah. Yeah, so it's right what you were thinking of, right, Sila? He used Herod, King Herod, because remember the devil, we've talked about this with the devil. He's described as like the prince of this world. He can have influences in different places. And so he was certainly using Herod to try to stop Jesus before he could do his work to save us. And so Herod was going to go and try to kill that child. And then remember later we heard in that story that he ended up killing all of the different babies in Bethlehem. So a really sad scene. Uh, we talk about it after Christmas each year. So that was one of them. Emma, do you want to read uh, Matthew 4, 8 to 10 for us? Let's listen to Emma first. Yeah. 
All right, so what was depicted there? Did you catch it, Sila and Lillian? Uh oh, I caught you guys, didn't I? What was that? Sorry. That. Ooh, okay. Make sure we're listening next time. Ethan, did you catch it? What story was that that Emma just read? What was the devil doing to Jesus? I don't think Zoom could hear it, so this is good that we can tell them. Tempting Jesus, yeah. So Emma just read the story when the devil was tempting Jesus, telling Jesus to bow down and worship him because he'd give him the kingdoms of the world. So he tried to stop Jesus by making him sin, making him not perfect anymore. We would be lost if Jesus had sinned because we needed his record of perfection and holiness so that it, we could become our own through his death and everything he did for us. And so if he would have sinned, we would have been done for. And so the devil tried to do that. And then finally, Max, Luke 22, Luke 22, verses three to six. Iscariot. Yep. All right. So you've got Satan entering. Who did you catch it? Who did Satan enter? Who betrayed Jesus? Peter did not hide him, but he didn't betray him, right? Who's that guy? You guys don't remember Jesus' betrayer? Judas. Judas Iscariot. So that literally, did you know that? We can miss that sometimes when we hear the story. In Luke 22, it literally says Satan entered Jesus. I mean, <laughs> Judas, Judas. Delete that part. <laughs> Judas, he entered Judas, right? So Satan was trying to end Jesus' life, get him killed. But what's kind of funny about that is the devil, it kind of shows you how foolish the devil was, right? Because Jesus had to die. The devil didn't even realize that. The devil thought, yeah, the devil thought he was getting this win by taking down Jesus. Because maybe, like, remember how many of the Jewish people thought Jesus was going to be like this earthly king? that would defeat the Romans and all this other stuff in some spectacular way. And so he thought, I'm going to kill him. But he didn't realize that by killing Jesus, he was doing the very thing that Jesus, that's exactly right. That's the moment he saved us. So it shows us how confused the devil was. So let's get those down on paper, shall we? So through Herod's brutality, Through here to remember that, and by getting crucified. All right. So you just heard those stories. I, I trust you can put those in your own words. I know I'm making you write fast. So in the battle that followed, actually decided what happened to Satan. Did he win? Of course, he was defeated. So we see that here in the in Revelation. I think we're actually skipping ahead of where we where we read. Sorry, but you can get that down because you already know because you're the scripture, scripture, scripture. Jesus actually won. He didn't win in the way that the devil thought, but he won through that. So let's listen to the rest of Revelation 12, 1 to twelve. So everybody, um, once you get that written down, please get your fingers. On verse seven. All right. So we got our friend Max again tonight. I know lately we've been doing the dramatized for me, but Max is easier to make start in a specific verse. So let's listen. Everybody got verse seven in their sights? Eyes on Bibles? All right. Here we go. 
Let's see how this war goes. And this angel fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accused them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice in heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. All right, he's pearled down to the abyss. And then, Max, this is the one I meant to ask you. When did Jesus defeat Satan? Yeah, when he died. You're saying that before. Where do you guys see that here? Did you catch it? There's a little connection for us. It's in verse 11. I guess I'm really zeroing you in. What does it say? How did they triumph? Sila? Yeah, they, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb. So Jesus' blood shed on the cross made us victorious over the devil. So now whenever the devil tempts us or tries to say God doesn't love us, we say no. We've been triumphed. We've triumphed over you. We've won the victory because Jesus shed his blood. Um, so you see how these are all connected? At first, these can be kind of strange visions, but then we realize, no, these are connections to the rest of God's word. Very not glorious to us, but something really glorious was happening there. The devil was being thrown down. All right? So we get to triumph over because of Jesus and we already see and it says and the word because see how it says and by the word of their testimony remember God's word is powerful it's a means of grace it doesn't return to God empty. it accomplishes what he wills for it Any questions on this first part of Revelation? This first reading of Revelation, we're going to jump backwards to Revelation 7 now. So everybody turn in your Bibles to Revelation 7. Let's see who gets to enjoy the blessings of Jesus' victory. We're going to start at verse 9 this time. We're going to do something new for 9. All right, keep your microphones muted on Zoom while we do this. But I want us to all read verse 9 together, okay? So everybody take a look at Revelation 7, verse 9. Wait until everybody gets there. This is important. Keep track of next. Revelation, verse 9. Or Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. So chapter 7, please. Chapter 7, verse 9. Chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 9. Chapter 7. 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 All right, you guys get in on Zoom? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. All right, everybody there? Let's read it together. Well, who, ha who has a, a different translation? <laughs> Sila does, and, both, and you guys both, I didn't think about that. So those of you who have the NIV 11, we're going to read it together. And then, so Sila, jump in maybe with Emma. Can you share with her for this verse? Yours isn't that either. Maybe this isn't going to work. I should have put it on the screen. That's all right. I guess now that everybody's there, I'll read it. Here we go. After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches 
in their hands. So there's this great multitude, every nation, tribe, language, people, white robes, palm branches. You see lots of pictures that we've seen before in the Bible. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. So read it again to yourself to make sure you get it. Okay? So he sees a huge crowd of people. How many people were there? How does he describe it? No one could count it. That's how many. A crazy number of people. All right, so more than anybody could count. Where were these people from? Gabe? All nations. Every tribe, language, and people. So all um, of all ages. It's going to be awesome. I mean, we don't know how age is going to work in heaven either. We don't have much in the Bible about that. But from all sorts of different places. And isn't that interesting? We see that there's still different races even in heaven. Because race isn't a bad thing. God's created that in his, in his wisdom, and, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, we still are different in different ways, but what brings us together is God's lamb, the lamb of God. All right? Where were they standing? These are all... Things. Where were they standing? Throne. The Lamb Jesus was the one on the throne. All right, we're just going to keep answering these straight up. What were they wearing? White robes. And finally, what were they holding? Ethan, did you catch that? What they were holding. Did you see it in verse verse nine there? Lillian, palm branches, just like you guys were just a few weeks ago. Palm branches. So you already see one connection, right? To Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in. Now he's there as the lamb, and they've got the palm branches. They're waving them because what do the palm branches represent? Do you remember what palm branches represent? Yeah. Take a guess. Take a crack at it. Yeah, they definitely included praise. They would do it for kings a lot. Sila? It's part of the connection. It brings it all around. But they don't really necessarily symbolize life. I, at least I don't. I haven't heard that, but they might have. But most of all, it was like a royalty victory kind of thing. So a lot of times, like victory parades, they'd wave the palm branches, and then when they're respecting a king, and a king, if they're if he's ruling in the land, that means he's got the victory, right? So they would represent. So that's what this one is. What do palm branches symbolize? Victory over an enemy. So Jesus, we just read it in chapter twelve. There's the palm branches all over the place. To, to verse 10. So let's go back to Max, shall we? Oh, you want to read it? Okay. I was talking about this, Max, but I, yeah, let's hear you. All right, but but notice, Max, it says, and they crowd out, cried out in a loud voice. So you got to read it in a loud voice, please. Go ahead. Salvation to the so there are more people there than you can count. Can you imagine how loud this would have been for John to see all praising Jesus? That's a scene that's just going to send chills down our spines when we get to see it. So we just heard it. Salvation belongs to our God. Everybody's recognized. Here in heaven, isn't because of anything we've done. Because what is God seed? Death, hostile, but salvation belongs to our God. He's the one who works in our hearts. And then we stand that throne in heaven, we're fully sanctified, fully made holy. It's because 
believe that salvation belongs to God. Verse 14. So we'll keep going. This time we'll listen to actual Max. <laughs> <laughs> That the bad way, Max. I meant this one. I can't remember. Anyone remember Bible Max? What is um, Bible? Bible Max. All right, <laughs> Max, you are an actual Max too. Okay, I promise. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's going to start with verse ten again. The angels were silent. Never mind. The throne and crowned the elders and the boiling leaders. They fell down their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, "Amen." Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor. And power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the other asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, So you so know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made the unwinding blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night. Temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb that sent on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a section. If you're ever really feeling the pain of this life, that's a good section to go and read. Because we see just all these wonderful things that we're going to get to have in heaven and eternal life with God. Man, and we'll, let's talk about it a little bit. So verse 14, we get to learn a few more things about all these people. What does it say about them? What did they do? Anyone on Zoom see that? Verse 14, he's describing these people and what they've been through. Let's go with... Uh, Christian, just because I can see you right now, did you catch that in verse 14? 14. What did these people come through? The great tribulation tribulation the great tribulation so tribulation is a word for like a great struggle a great uh some might say like a battle um so yeah people have been through a great time of trouble that's what the great tribulation is talking about so we've got all these people around the throne that are from all sorts of other all sorts of places how have they been through trouble what do you think that trouble is talking about that yeah, could be one thing. Sin. Yeah, feel free to shout some things out. What are some things we go through here? Pain. Like some of the stuff they said we won't have in heaven. Pain. Sin. Some people fall away for a time and come back to God. Sometimes people lose, you know, just lose loved ones or they get yeah, a lot of different things. But most of all, the sin, yeah, emotional pain. Um, but you're right, Max, that, that sin that we have. God brought us through that, that the pain in this, in this world where the devil is so tempting us and is like a roaring lion. He's brought us through that. So the people John saw before the throne had robes washed and white. But what seems it, Emma? Yeah. Yeah, they washed the robes with the blood. Which would normally stain rather than clean. It's, it's a, you guys know that. Yeah. You don't have to write all of that. But they wash it with the blood. The blood of the land is what purifies. So just like we were saying, salvation belongs to our God. Well, it's only the blood of the land that makes us purified before God. So you can write that in your words for sure, for sure. All right. Yet these robes come out clean in the blood of jesus um we don't even need to read isaiah 118 i think you guys know the answer to this one what stain has been removed lillian from us what stain has been removed the stain of sin yeah isaiah 118 says though there come let us reason together 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be, does anyone remember how that one ends? As white as, they will be as white as, what's something really white that you know? Snow. I know we don't see it much in Georgia, but snow. White as snow. Yep, that's what th that passage says. <laughs> All right, let's keep looking here. So we, we see, I think, verses six and seven, you know, there's most comfort in the whole Bible. So be brought through this. Uh, what will happen for them? for them? Just put it right out of the Bible there. What, what is it saying to us? What's heaven going to be like? Take a look at verse 16 for me, Ethan, and tell me what heaven is going to be like. What do you think? So no hunger, no thirst. Yeah. No more sunburn and pain. I mean, even little things you don't think about that much. Gone. It's going to not be there anymore. Because we don't even need a sun. Because look, the land at the center. And in other places in Revelation, it talks about how he glows and he is the light. Um, yeah, like the sun. That's why you see that sun of righteousness sometimes. And people change it to S-U-N because he's going to shine like the sun. Um, he's going to be our shepherd. He's going to give us these springs of water. And look at very last verse, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We can't even, I think I said it in the sermon on Sunday, that when we are talking about eternal life, we can only really start to understand what it's not, because we can't wrap our minds around perfection. And we're so used to pain and tears that we can't even start to imagine that just being completely it breaks your brain a little bit doesn't it because this world is a lot of what we're doing in this world is because of the sin and the pain in it but wow to have all that gone and no more tears that's what we have to know it's not it's not pain it's not tears it's not hunger we don't hear a lot about what it is because we're going to get to find out one day when we can understand so you guys heard it not hungry no thirsting, no um, no heat. He's gonna take away their tears. And then I already yes, Ethan, you got a question? Can you wait just one sec? We're just going to do these last two questions really fast, and I'm going to give you a little break. Is that okay? Okay, awesome. So we already answered this one. Who are these people? What's that? All the nations, everyone, which includes you. It includes you. So these people are from all nations, but specifically who are, it's not literally all nations though that are there. I mean, like it's not every person from every nation. What people are these specifically that we find? Yeah, people who believed in Jesus, who, who um, watched clean from that. Jesus, remember Jesus sacrificed his justification. It means that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but not everyone is saved, right? Not everybody goes to heaven. Everybody was saved by Jesus. So not everyone is personally saved and goes to heaven because some people reject that. Because through faith, we receive salvation. And that's called subjective justification. That only the people who believe in Jesus go to heaven. So Jesus' death was enough for all. Some people reject. And so then only some go to heaven. So you and me and all people who believe in Jesus have been cleansed from sin. And you can put that in your own words. Just talk about believers. Believers, there, one word, you got it. And finally, so we can get to our break really quick. Um, the people who stood before the throne in John's vision witnessed the glory of God. We review that. That's what we pray every time we finish the Lord's Prayer, right? It's a picture of this. Wow, God, you, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. 
because we know these things about God. This isn't necessarily one answer is right, but because we know these about God, what can we be sure about? Take 10 seconds to think about that on your own. Since you know that God did all these things, what does that mean you can be sure about? And write an answer that you would put in your own words. What can we be sure about? Put something down. There's probably a lot of different things. All right, thank you. Here's what this author said. Keep all promises and answer our prayers. So we also know that he's going to be with us. We know that, wow, if he's the one controlling heaven, he's going to bring us to be with him, Dave. Right. Yeah, so now we're going to take, I'm going to give you guys, everybody, take three minutes. Okay, we're going to do it right. So it's 7.57 from that thing here, and we'll keep going, okay? We're almost done. We got one more section. Yep. All right. Is everybody doing okay? Coming out about Judas. And then, yeah, tribulation is hardship. Thank you very much. Charlie and Gabe, are you still there? I can't see you guys tonight. Yes, I'm reading it. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. And Gabe, I got your tests from your mom, okay? So I'll take a look at them, and, and uh, I'll be in contact with you about things to finish up before confirmation day. Okay. We're getting there. Keep working hard. You're doing well. Just got to keep working hard, though. Because, right? Is Pastor Malzo treating you okay? Yeah. We went camping last week, I think. Oh, awesome. Did you go with him? Yeah, I went him for three days. Oh, that's awesome. You know that that's my cousin, right? Did your mom tell you that? No, I did not know that. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah, we're first cousins, Pastor Malzo and I. Oh. Is that blowing your mind? <laughs> so yeah, his mom's my aunt. And his dad's my, my, my uncle. You guys feel free to take a little, at least like stand up. Let's some, uh, get the blood flowing a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it's place. Hey, where did you get those A secret stash I could teach you more easily. It's Why? Secret stash of the Yeah. No, it's still there. It's the floor is clean. It's just five seconds. Five seconds. Don't worry about the pieces right now. It's all good. All right, we'll get restarted. We'll let Gabe. Gabe can take his time. All right, guys, you ready to turn to the very last chapter? That's pretty hard. Revelation. Last chapter. Oh, I forget. God, there's 22. You know why I always mix that up? In seminary, we had a code that was supposed to be the last verse of the Bible, but they switched the numbers. So it was um, Revelation 21, 22, but it was supposed to be 22, 21. And so now I always accidentally say there's only 
21 chapters in Revelation, but there are 22. Thanks, Emma. So the second last chapter, sorry, we have to go to the second last chapter. But you can go on and read the rest if you want. It's up to you. All right. So everybody there at the start of chapter 21, we're going to read this in little sections. So here's the part I quoted at the beginning of class. Remember that heaven's not just the sky place, but we're going to get a new heavens and a new earth. So I'm going to read chapter or verse one, and then we're going to go around the room like before. But we're going to take it in sections. So Sila verse two and Emma verse three. Here we go. Revelation 21. Everybody there? Eyes on Bibles. Perfect. Thank you. Here we go. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. Awesome. So yeah, we see God with his people. It's just a beautiful thing. So remember, that this is connecting a lot of history. This is a really long thing to read. Charlie, are you saying something? Um, so this is a good thing to read, though, because it reminds us of what we've gone through. So Lillian, would you be reading, willing to read number 21 off of page 226 for us in the workbook? The workbook. Number, number 21. On page 226. Intimate. You can just skip the lessons. That's good. Presence. So how will it be different at the end of the time? All this other stuff ended. God appearing. Maybe Lillian can answer the question she read. How's it going to be different at the end of time? You got it. God's going to live with us forever. Yeah, that's what we see right here in these verses. That God is going to live with us forever. And I mean, we don't want to ignore this really beautiful thing, right? The, the new heavens and the new earth, it's described like this beautiful holy city coming down from heaven. Um, but notice how Revelation mixes metaphors all the time. So, you know, at first he's talking about this city, but then the city is dressed up like a bride. And your brain just goes like, what? Like a city dressed like a bride? Is she, a city wearing a giant dress? Or, you know, it, it, it's not meant to make sense for us. Remember, heaven's beyond our understanding. It's going to just, the point is it's beautiful. Because like a beautiful, yeah, maybe. Because like beautiful lights. And things that are beautiful city we understand a bride beautifully the same big tunes that you know are beautiful and combine them because heaven's gonna be even better. Um so that's part of why that happens. All right. Verse four, Ethan, would you be one to read verse four in Revelation 21? yeah so just like before right all this old stuff and pain and sin in that we know now is going to be gone no more place sin will be gone and you can put that in your words but we'll keep we'll keep chugging along here so verse five i'd like gabe to read that one one in Max 3, verse 6. Max, go ahead, verse 6, please. 
there he said to me, It is done, and we all but hear the name. The beginning and the end to the thirsty of the water, out tossed from the strength of the water. Yeah, so forgiveness is pictured here as a water of life. And what does it cost to us? Nothing. It's completely free from God. And there's some really, really cool things in here. Alpha and Omega. Do you guys know what the Alpha and the Omega is? Sometimes you've probably seen it in church. Alpha looks like this sometimes, and then Omega. What'd you say, Peter? Do you know what the Alpha and Omega is? It's the beginning and the end. So it's the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet that the, that the New Testament was written in. So he's saying that like I'm everything, the beginning and the end. That's why he clarifies it. Yep. Alpha and the Omega. That's one of the cool titles we have for Jesus. And then finally, verses seven and eight. I think our internet's doing a little better. Uh, Charlie, would you be willing to read verse seven for us? And then Gabe, I think we'll have you read verse eight. Okay. Go ahead, verse seven. I gotta get it. I gotta. 21.7. Gabe, do you have 21.7? All right, we should have been following along already, right? Should have I had it. You got it? I had, no, I had it pulled up, but then, like, my Bible kind of shut. Like, because, you know, it's at the end of the Bible, and then I let go of it, and it was like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. Oh, I see. You don't have a hardbound one. Yeah, it's like a kind of like a soft kind of like leathery kind of. So it pulled easily. Flops. All right, do you got 21.7? Uh, I was in 24. I'm almost there. I'm just trying to get to the page. 424. What's the verse or the chapter? Chapter 21, verse 7. 21, verse 7. All right, everybody in here, now we're about to read it. So get, get your eyes on it. 21, 7. 21, 7. What are you doing, Max? 21, verse yeah. 7. All right, go ahead. It's in Revelation, right? I, I found it. Okay. All right. Go ahead. 21.7. Those who are victori victorious will inherit all this and will be their God, and they will be my children. All right, Gabe, do you have verse 8? All right. You're talking, you're talking to me. Next time, have it. But Charlie, since you already have it. Oh, sorry. Actually, I'm talking to you, Gabe. Sorry, I should have uh, clarified. Do you have verse 8? You don't have it? It's in Revelation. Yeah. Well, let's just let Charlie read it, though. Just listen to Charlie because he already has it. Do you still have it, Charlie? Read verse yeah. 8. 8. But the cowardly and unbelieving and vile, the murderers, the sexual and mortal, those who practice magic arts, the idlers, the liars, they will be consigned to the fury, the fury lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. All right. Thank you. This will help us answer our final two questions. So first, let's jump to verse eight. If we reject God's good of, gift of forgiveness, what's going to happen? What's described here? Sila? Yeah, we'll suffer in hell. That's what it's representing, this, this lake of death. Unbelieving is that serious. The reason why we want to make sure we tell our friends and, and others in our lives, too. But we get to hear the good news, too. Right? Verse 25, by God's grace. And remember, it's completely by God's grace. We are completely black and part by sin. 
sanctification is about he came to us. Because he made us right with God and because of the blood of the Lamb, what do we get, Ethan? Heaven? How did the word how did the text verse seven word it? Not just heaven, but all this, I guess. We get to be God's chief part of God's family. We're going to jump right into the key questions because you can remember that eternal life, God's family. So, how faithful is God to his promise to save mankind from their sins? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. Perfectly faithful. Jesus destroyed Satan's work and rescued us from sin and death. Excellent. And B, he lived the perfect life in our place and then died in our place. Just as God promised, what does that mean for us? We go up, not just up, but new heavens, new earth, all these things. We get eternal life. We'll be in heaven with him forever. That's what we've been studying this whole time. All points to it. And finally, how important is it for us to, get, to be in God's word and be reminded of this every day of our lives. <laughs> yes, these are all pretty easy, huh? It's the most important part. So don't just take that as, oh yeah, obvious. Act like it. Remember that this is the most important. It's really easy to say it, but it is the most important thing. Because you just read the consequences. The consequences are either life in heaven with God because... He saved us, blood of the lamb. Or if we reject it, it's hell. We want to know that and tell others and be thankful that you know it. That's by the grace of God. All right. And maybe this kind of relates. This is your last salvation to everyone of every nation. So let's read this together. For I am not, oh, everybody, I was very quick. I'm sorry, I forgot you to read right. Here we go. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So it's for everyone. And your homework? is if you have your worksheet plan and worksheet make sure you get the design and service company pick up me you get to help pick the hints you get to help pastor know what to preach on because it's your day this is your special day when you're making your promises that's really awesome so make sure you do that. Those are confirmed. And then Gabe, I'll make sure I send it to you. I think your mom actually got it, Gabe. Um, just ask her about amendments that you learned this year and the what does this mean. And then finally, next week will be our final test. For those of you who remember, it's a little bit of a different order than other years, which might make it a little harder, but just make sure you study hard this week and make sure you come to church on Sunday. One, because of the parent meeting, so I hope you'd be there, but come at 9.15 a.m. Because at 9.15 a.m. on Sunday, at Sunday school hour, there's going to be a review with Mr. Patrick, and he'll have Jeopardy and stuff ready for you guys and so that you can crush this test. So I'm going to give you all a study sheet to make sure you throw your parents and you have some studying together. There are a whole bunch of words in the back. I would recommend going through it and writing yourself a little definition of words from all year. Use your catechisms. In the back of the catechism is a glossary. Oh, thank you. In the back of your catechism is a glossary that has all the words. Not all of them, but almost all. So work through that. On Sunday, you'll get to ask questions. If there are any words that you don't know, and this goes for people on Zoom too, I'm going to send the review sheet to your parents um, right away here. If there are any questions and any words, you just can't find the answer. Your parents can't find the answer. 
just text Pastor or I, and we'd be happy to help. Text us, email us, and we're happy to help you. And bring your questions to church on Sunday. And uh, maybe uh, Mr. Patrick will be able to help you. If he's not, he'll ask us, just like you can. So, all right, guys, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this awesome year of studying through this green book um, and, help, and helping us use it to, to study your word. Uh, bless us tonight as we go home and bless us always through it. In Jesus' name, amen.